Morning. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be talking about three projects where uh, we have led the development of a new musical instrument, and crucially, the importance of working uh, with a disabled musician. Oh, yes. We're just waiting for the slides to appear. Ah, there we go. Uh, and crucially, the, the importance of working with a disabled musician uh, in the process and avoiding the temptation to uh, design with a top-down model. Um, in 2012, well, Drake Music has been around since the uh, late 1980s uh, and was founded by Adele Drake in uh, London as a, a place to make musical, uh, music accessible for disabled people. Uh, in 2012, uh, we started a new program to explore whether the interest in making and coding as a creative and recreational pursuit could combine with what I thought was a lack of creativity and diversity in accessible musical instrument design. So what I mean there is this, this new kind of thing of hacker culture, of fab labs, of hack, uh, hack labs, um, hack spaces, that kind of thing, the, the idea of making as a, as a thing to do for fun and uh, a recreational um, activity. And I mean, essentially, I suppose I was looking also at the resources going into things like app design, iPhones, uh, phone design, uh, all the way through to things like Lego Mindstorms and comparing this amazing diversity of, of new technology and, and investment that's going everywhere into what I thought was a startling lack of innovation in musical instrument design. So the tools we were using uh, at Drake Music, the musical instruments we were using, hadn't really changed uh, much in the 20 years that we've been doing the work at that point, uh, with the exception of uh, the iPad, which had come out and uh, not designed specifically as accessible music technology, uh, but with some access needs had proved to be kind of quite revolutionary actually because of new tools available but also there's something which I think feels like it'll be a theme has been uh, talked about already today this idea of uh, universal design of good design being good for everyone and when accessibility can be brought into that I think it's sort of it's good for society as a whole um, so the question we were asking ourselves really was, what, would running hackathons lead to a broader musical instrument cupboard? Would there be more instruments available? And what impacts for accessibility would this have? But also what impacts for musical choice would it have? So obviously if you choose to play an oboe, it's a very difficult, different musical and cultural choice to playing a, an electric guitar or the drum machine and says a lot about who we see ourselves as, as people, where we fit in with society and what we want to say. Um, so we started this program with a, a little grant and a little bit of money, and our initial designs were very much concerned with what um, I and my team thought was wrong with the design of musical instruments. And consequently, we made the mistake of really focusing on the technology and the idea that we, the makers, the people with the resources, uh, could solve the problems for disabled people. And when I reflect on this over the years, it, it feels to me a little bit like we were trying to solve problems at people. And it's not empowering to do that. And it was certainly not disabled-led. And um, I'm very pleased to say, purely by accident, the program was moved to a much more user-centered co-design model. Well, I'm not pleased to say it was by accident, but I'm pleased to say it moved to a user-centered co-design model. Um, where we solved the specific access problems uh, that musicians presented us with. And this is where the really exciting developments have occurred. And I'm going to talk now about the, the three key projects that have uh, really caused that change to happen. And I think the really important message is that these have come from these disabled musicians and they've come to us and forced a change in my program, which I am delighted with, actually. So about the same time that we were experimenting with the beginning of this new technology, uh, we were also supporting artistic development for disabled musicians. And as part of this, we ran a workshop. I realize I'm not doing the PowerPoint at all. I'm just off on my own. So I'm just going to scan through the slides there. Um, so here's uh, a picture of the hackathon. There's a picture here of um, a hackathon we did at the South Bank Center, uh, one at Queen Mary University in London. And same, actually, same one here. This is John Kelly and Adam John Williams. Um, together, John Kelly, I'll be speaking about in a bit. Um, so around the same time we were experimenting with this new way of working with hacker and maker culture, uh, we started uh, a new program with artistic development at Drake Music. And we ran a, a workshop uh, for 10 musicians in London. And one of the artists who came was Chris Halpin. And this is a, a picture of Chris Halpin here. He's sitting in his recording studio. 
couple of speakers behind him and sort of the normal stuff you'd expect to see in a recording studio there. Uh, he's a professional musician. Um, he had an established career, and around the time we met, um, his impairment, he's a disabled musician, uh, was beginning to seriously impact his music making for the first time. And actually, I mean, it's having quite a profound impact, as I guess we'd all expect it to have. He was beginning to question whether or not he could even continue to be a performing artist. That's how severe it was affecting him. Um, and this was the first time that my programme had been approached by a musician with a specific access need, with a specific kind of gowan. This is my problem. Can you help me? And I initially explored it with the, the tools we had, um, the stuff we use in our learning work. So we had um, the iPad apps, things like GarageBand, Thumb Jam, MadPad, which, as I said, can be accessible, not universally accessible, certainly not. Um, there's an instrument called the Skoog, which was developed uh, with Nesta funding in the UK over the last sort of 10, 15 years. And there's a, a, a sort of, certainly in the UK, a famous instrument called the Soundbeam, which for physical disabilities uh, has been an important piece of work over the last 30, 40 years, and is a, is a great instrument. Um, but for Chris's use, none of these really matched his artistic needs. Um, and while they're interesting, his expectations around control and expression as a musician exceeded what he could achieve with those tools. Now, I mean, there's, there's many things of chance that go on in this, this story, and it happened to coincide with Drake Music and my program working with the Mimu Gloves team, uh, on an application for academic funding uh, to Nesta, actually, together with the University of Ulster. And uh, we were working with the Mimu Gloves, uh, which is, there's a picture up here. And what they are is they're a, a wearable music technology, and they were developed by a team uh, led by a musician called Imogen Heap. Um, she's also now an advocate for Drake Music. She's a Grammy award-winning musician and has collaborated with uh, many sort of uh, big and famous people, including um, Ariana Grande, who's also a gloves wearer. The gloves themselves, uh, there's a picture here, um, they have many electronics and sensors on them, haptic motors in the back, uh, which provide a uh, feedback as to when you're doing something. Uh, they've got flex sensors on the knuckles, so when you bend your fingers, uh, you, it knows that you're doing that. There's a LED that lights up and again can be used for feedback and then it provides a uh, connection to a computer over Wi-Fi using something called a, an IMU motion tracker, which basically just gives you a, uh, a direct link uh, back to the computer. So all these sensors can then be programmed into something musical and useful. So we were hoping to gain funding to explore how these gloves could be used as accessible music technology. And the assumption was that we'd need to make some changes to them and uh, change the design. Um, and we were going to work with someone with a physical impairment. Sadly, we weren't successful in getting the funding, but managed to scrape together just about enough money, as we say, from the back of the sofa to get a set of gloves and just at least continue with this idea of using them. And they were actually made to fit in my hands um, because someone had to sort of model them. And uh, we had loose plans for a testing program, and sort of, you know, we didn't quite know what we'd do. But I asked Chris to come to the launch with me. And we agreed it'd at least be interesting for him to explore uh, the gloves, and uh, we could see whether or not they work for him. And as, as luck would have it, uh, Chris and I have exactly the same size hands. We didn't know this at the time. Uh, and this was really important because it quickly became apparent that these gloves were really exactly what he needed. Um, it's a picture of Chris at the South Bank Centre uh, on the South Bank of uh, the Thames in London. Just a, a portrait, he's wearing his gloves. Um, so the key ingredients, I think, for why they worked is they were designed by a musician. So Imogen Heap, this musician and sort of uh, technological visionary, had an idea of what she wanted. And so they're very expressive and deep in their potential. And by design, adaptable, because she wanted something that she could kind of say to her team, tomorrow, I want to do this. And this allows for precise collabora uh, calibration, rather, and uh, in Chris's case, this meant that it allowed for his impairment and indeed would allow for subsequent changes in his impairment because it read um, his hand movement and we could then track that to a musical, um, a, a musical expression or note or both. And uh, so by complete chance, we'd stumbled across a technology that allowed for Chris both uh, his access needs but also provided the path forward um, which was in the shape of a complex instrument that needed to be learnt. Um, and the fact they're hard to learn, I, I think, is something which is really important. It's something they've got in common with a lot of musical instruments. Uh, and 
that's another reason I think they're, they've been successful for us. Um, uh, in my opinion, a lot of accessible musical instruments that are out there focus too much on initial access, which is also very important. But um, there is this sense of providing a path to virtuosity, I think. So if you're going to start on a musical journey, then, I mean, certainly for me as a musician, I want to know that in 40 years' time, I'm still going to be enriched and learning from my practice. And uh, I think the Mimu gloves have that potential because of their complexities. Um, here's a, a picture of myself, Chris, and Imogen at that launch party, um, just accepting the gloves there. So Chris now had an instrument that provided a path back to being a performing artist, and he, he had a cutting-edge music technology, uh, which only a handful of artists still have, actually. I, I've put had, but still had. Uh, most famously, of course, Imogen Heap and Ariana Grande. And combined, combining this with being a disabled musician, he, um, using one of the most advanced and cutting-edge technologies, out there, he, he got a lot of opportunities really to perform, and effectively a new career formed for Chris. And within a year, he was touring a solo show um, with the gloves. He performed a duet with Imogen Heap herself at a small venue in London. Uh, he was on the BBC, in, uh, he was on newspapers, he had lots of web presence. He's just been invited to go to Washington to perform. Um, so incredible, life-changing, um, but it had other unforeseen so uh, consequences, this kind of new artistic life for him. Um, because the new work and the new instrument didn't enter into a vacuum. And it came to Chris when he was already a mature artist. And he had a style that was built on years of guitar playing, of piano playing. And interestingly, I was talking to him recently, and he, he said to me, over these two years, he began to feel a bit conflicted. Like there was a gap between who he was becoming as an artist and who he had been, and how he had identified as an artist before. And so I suppose, in short, the new instrument, the new tool, uh, was leading to a new artistic aesthetic and one which required a new voice. And um, so he's just literally, in May, launched a new project called Diskinetic, which uh, is, in effect, a, a musical brand relaunch. Um, but I think also is this kind of a way of, for him, squaring this circle of kind of who he is as a, an artist now that he's using this new technology and, I guess, uh, other musicians in the audience will appreciate that the, the instrument you use and the limitations it imposes do dictate with you the, the art that you then make. So the R&D program, DM Lab, that I run was gaining some profile uh, through the work with Chris and the hackathons we'd run. So we'd run hackathons with the South Bank Centre, British Council, people like that. And in 2015, uh, a conductor and composer called James Rose got in touch and he conducts with his head um, and at the time, he was using, uh, among other things, the baton that is pictured there on the uh, right. So there's a picture of James on the left, just smiling. And on the right, he's wearing a, a helmet with a, a baton that's kind of coming out just below the chin. And that was an adaptation that was made for him. Um, he needed a better baton, basically. He needed something uh, to conduct with. The existing designs were too cumbersome. They weren't practical. They were imprecise, but they also weren't aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and I think all these things are not ideal when leading a chamber orchestra. Uh, if I think back to when he approached us, my most vivid recollection really is the combination of his vision. He really knew what he was doing and how he was going to get there, and his persistent. He was absolutely convinced we were going to help him, and uh, that was great. We did. So I met James one-on-one -on -one initially, and uh, he quickly became part of our community and started attending our monthly meetings. We have a, a monthly hack meet in London and one in Manchester as well. And uh, it struck me almost straight away that, uh, as he's a glasses wearer, uh, the most obvious thing to try and do was to combine the baton with the glasses. Um, so I did an initial hack, an initial prototype, where I used um, some mains electronic components. So there's a picture here of a pair of glasses, and I've literally glued the insides of an electrical fitting to the right arm of the glasses and then taken a, a baton for conducting and sawn the cork bit off the end and pushed it through. And this was the initial kind of proof of concept or, or hack, if you like, that uh, gave us a way forward. Um, the final version I then passed to uh, my colleague Louis Zayas, who's part of our community of makers, who I can't talk about in detail now, but suffice to say he's a full-time developer by his day job and comes and volunteers with us. Uh, and uh, he 3D printed a beautiful 
bespoke baton that fits exactly on the side of his glasses around the arm using magnets and allows him to uh, put it on and off and there's a counterweight on the other side. Um, almost immediately after the baton was completed, James secured funding from the Arts Council of England to do a week's training with the Royal Academy of Music under the tutelage of Sean Edwards, who's head of conducting. And so simply put, the baton was the only thing that stopped James, and this had now been sorted. So he was able to get on with being the visionary and amazing artist that he is. Um, he completed a week at the Royal Academy of Music, made a film uh, about the experience, and there's a picture here of him conducting a chamber orchestra in the Royal Academy of Music in London with Sean uh, to, uh, to his right, yes. Um, so, I mean, I just think it's the power of, of being able to give someone the right tool to overcome their barriers there. Um, in late 2016, he learned that he'd been awarded uh, an 18-month training placement with Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, which actually had nothing to do with us. This was just him getting on with being the artist he is, um, and he's part of the Changemakers Project funded by the Arts Council, and that will see him develop a new ensemble comprising of disabled and non-disabled musicians. And again, this is the clear example, really, of uh, how good design, bespoke design, can remove the, the barriers faced by disabled musicians and allow them to succeed on their own terms. Um, the last uh, person I want to talk about is uh, John Kelly. He's a disabled musician. He's a um, writer, campaigner for disability rights, and he's been co-leading this program with me for the last four years. Um, a couple of years ago, he came to me with uh, an idea that would be quite revolutionary, actually. He's been playing guitar on, on and off all his life, um, but his impairment is such that he's, he's prevented from fretting the guitar. So he's been uh, only able to play with open tunings at the moment. Uh, well, uh, up until that point. Um, since 2012, he's been using the iPad and the GarageBand uh, app on the iPhone and the iPad. Um, and uh, this has allowed him to sort of start to perform in the company himself and uh, following a path that he's sort of aspired to and that his, um, the people he looked up to as, as an artist were doing. And very quickly, because I know time's short, I mean, seeing someone using a, a, an app like this in that way, certainly for me, uh, did a lot uh, to humble me and uh, challenge my preconceptions about the worth of a, a free app from, uh, from Apple as a, a genuine musical tool. So his innovation was to combine the concept of uh, GarageBand's virtual guitar, uh, where here you can strum down the strings on a particular chord, uh, with a real physical guitar which had actual, actual strings. So I guess the question this design posed was, would it be possible to combine the sensitivity and expressivity of real guitar strings uh, with the accessibility that John was finding for, uh, with GarageBand? And I think it's important to point out that these are all bespoke solutions for these peop uh, for John's um, access needs in this case, so not necessarily accessible to everyone. Um, we had a chance to, to try this at a hackathon uh, that we ran at the South Bank Centre uh, shortly afterwards, and I bought an old guitar, um, put a bit of wood on it as a short neck, and uh, the early design, I used some uh, piezo pickups, which uh, gave some problems later on. And Charles Matthews, who's pictured there with John and the, the early prototype of the guitar in front of them, has done an awful lot of work on the coding and the, uh, in a language called Max, MSP, uh, which is a, an audio coding language. Uh, the resulting instrument won the hackathon and basically hugely exceeded our expectations. Um, we'd done it, we'd proved the concept, it was possible, and we had a guitar which responded to the vibrations and allowed for note and chord selection using a phone interface. Um, certainly a moment of success for the team, but much more importantly, uh, John's lifelong dream had been realized. He could play guitar on an instrument that had the potential to reach his um, musical vision. Um, and after much discussion, we decided to call it the Kelly Caster. And there's a picture of him having that first play there. It's difficult, really, to overstate sort of what a big moment that is. So it, was, it was a very emotional time and a portrait of him there as well. So this success led to a lot of interest in our program, but also to our dilemma and uh, how do we proceed? And it sat on the back burner. We were looking for funding and eventually came up with some funding from our partners at Ulster University through uh, the Cholesterol Banking Foundation. And we started working on a concert-ready version of this same guitar. And uh, again, Charles involved. And we commissioned a, a master guitar builder to make the actual guitar itself. Uh, we used uh, a Roland system, uh, the, the musical instrument manufacturer Roland, uh, for the pickups. And actually ended up making a custom 
new computer system using the Bella system from Queen Mary University, which allows for uh, sub one millisecond round trip latency uh, in coded audio design, which um, to explain that it basically means very quick response to something that you've coded, uh, which for expressive uh, work in musical instrument building is, is incredible. Um, Suffice to say that this piece of technology is sort of near magical, actually. It's, it's crazy what they do. Um, there's many, many things I could tell you about this project, but the really important thing is that we achieved the creation of an accessible guitar, and we realized John's own musical vision, and his design had overcome the barriers that prevented him from having the choice to be a guitarist, and he's now performing with the Kelly Caster. He's accompanying himself in pubs. He's traveling internationally. Um, so again, a profound uh, change, and here's a picture of the, the new version just there. Okay, so I think just to wrap up, I would just want to challenge you as you think about accessibility and design at this conference. Uh, I guess learn from us, resist the urge to solve issues for disabled people, and instead reach out and co uh, consult with your customers, with your potential collaborators, and uh, co-design. So thank you very much.